Okay, um, good morning. I hope you all had a good weekend. I missed you all terribly. Um, Lena, where's Lena? Lena and David. Lena, David? Le oh, Lena, that was for you. You requested the Arctic Monkeys on, on, um, on Beach Space, and that was for you and for David, who um, doesn't deserve it because he's not here. Um, I wanted to make a couple of administrative um, announcements. The first is to remind you to begin thinking about doing a potential research paper. Um, and if you're interested in doing that, um, to encourage you to come and talk to me today in my office hours or next week or in the weeks um, ahead. My office hours are 1 to 3 o'clock um, today. And um, I always uh, love talking to you and hearing um, what you're interested in. Um, by the way, another thing that people frequently come to me for office hours um, to discuss is where they might go for a um, semester abroad if they're planning on going to the UK. So I'm actually perfectly happy to have those conversations because I can um, give you all my prejudices and opinions um, uh, in, in, in uncensored types of ways about the types of places you might like to go. Um, Finally, I wanted to, um, uh, to let you know that the course syllabus is now live on my website and it's just a lot easier for using the link. So I don't know how many of you are actually using my page as opposed to the BSpace page. Yeah, well, not many, but it's a lot easier. Um, um, so I do encourage you to, to, to do that because um, it just works uh, more effectively. Okay, I've got, I think we've got a reasonably fun week this week, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Um, so last week, I used, if you remember, those two sets of contrasting events, the Great Exhibition and the Irish Famine, and the revolts in, in, in Britain in 1848 and in India in 1857, to demonstrate the principles of, of liberal... At political economy and how they had become what I called the common sense of the age by the late 1840s and 1850s and seemed to be almost beyond question even though, and this was the point that I hope you took, even though they had quite devastating consequences uh, for many people. Um, so today I'm going to um, and this week generally, do, do something similar but a little different, which is to say that this week's lectures are basically about the restructuring and redefinition of politics that happens as a consequence of a whole series of liberal reforms. Is this mic very loud? We really don't need me mic'd up, do we? Especially as I have a cold and... It's, it's annoying me. Um, so, yes, I'm going to have a look at this uh, restructuring of politics through this whole series of um, uh, liberal reforms. And today, I'm going to talk about the emergence of a new type of state. Um, and it's the emergence of a type of state that we should be reasonably familiar with, because in many ways, it is... Um, the origins of the type of state that we live under today. And so therefore, lots of what I'm going to be telling you today will seem completely, um, completely unre unrevealing um, because we're just used to living un uh, under these types of conditions. But what I'm going to be trying to emphasize to you today is that this new type of state emerged at a very specific historical moment and under a very specific type of historical process. Um, and I'm going to give you the broad outlines of what that new state uh, looks like, and then I'm going to give you these case studies, if you like, to demonstrate how they work through the cases of the new poor law, the uh, public health, and if I have time, which I doubt, um, uh, education. And there you were thinking that that was the introduction to the lecture. But no, there's more. Um, 
British historians, and I think British historians are not unique in this, but they maybe get a little carried away by themselves, have become um, obsessed with discovering what they call revolutions in government. Okay? Basically, you can, the historians have talked about a revolution in government happening in every century from the 16th century through to the 20th century. Okay? So clearly, you know, it becomes a little incredible to have so many revolutions in government. But each revolution in government that historians identify marks a particular change in the nature or the character of the state. And they often start by going back to Thomas Hobbes's um, uh, classic account of a new type of, uh, a theory of a new type of state in the Leviathan, um, the frontispiece or half of the frontispiece of which is um, um, on the slide uh, behind me. So like Hobbes, these historians are basically interested in the nature of the modern state and how it is that it can claim a legitimate monopoly of power and violence over its subjects. Hence, you can see the Leviathan rising out of the landscape, holding the sword, the monopoly of violence, and the staff, the monopoly of authority and power. And, if, and it, you can't read the little Latin inscription at the top, but it reads, there is no power on earth to be compared to him. Okay? This is a, a monstrous um, uh, a apparition. Now, I'm going to be suggesting to you today that what happens in the 19th century is a different type of state emerges, and it's one that's characterized not by a, um, a, 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 the monopoly of power by a sovereign figure of authority, but through a process of a new type of bureaucratic authority, a new type of bureaucratic government, in which power becomes largely abstract. That is to say that you're governed by people that you will never meet or know. Okay? And this marks a decisive shift, I'm going to say. And it's a shift that, of course, relates to my earlier lectures where I've been trying to explain how Britain in the mid-19th century is a new type of society, a society um, made up largely of strangers. So that's a really important big theme of this lecture. Another big theme of this lecture is to return to the sort of paradox of the nature of the liberal state. Okay? Now you've read the readings of the, uh, in the textbook who worry, and, the, and, the, and the piece by Eric Evans that both worry around this paradox. How come you can have a liberal philosophy of laissez-faire, of the state retreating from um, all spheres of activity, and yet, at the same point, have an enormous uh, growth in the power and size of the state. That's the puzzle that historians are trying to figure out in the 19th century. And I'm going to suggest to you, and this is a little different from the textbook and a little different from Eric, Eric Evans's version of it on the online readings, I'm going to suggest to you that the growth of the state, that this new type of mid-Victorian state was essential for imposing the conditions in which liberalism could flourish. This is the so-called rule of freedom. Okay? That to make people free, you have to actively intervene upon them. Okay? So there's no such thing as abstract liberty where you're free from government. It's more about the state creating the conditions of freedom under which you will live. And I'm going to suggest to you today that what that does is not just create a, 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 or try and produce a new type of liberal person, but also creates a new series of domains under which the state reacts differently. And I'm talking specifically there about the distinction between economy, society, and politics. Okay, up until this time, I've been talking to you about political economy as all one big joined up thing. It's in the, from the 1830s and 1840s that you begin to get an understanding of the economy as something entirely separate from, uh, from politics, and politics and economy as something entirely separate from society as a whole. And that has large implications 
for the way in which the state um, acts and where it acts and how it acts. Finally, the other big theme of the lecture is going to be that this emergence of a new type of anonymous bureaucratic state is not um, uh, a one-way street. Okay? It relies absolutely upon a dialectical process where bureaucratic authority is also um, given shape in the, in, the, in the form of specific individuals enacting that locally. The centralization of state authority actually serves to reanimate local politics in particular ways. So I want to make sure that you understand that I'm not talking about you know, a one model fits all that's imposed from above. This is a, a process which relies upon a lot of give and take and in a way the creation of the very thing that the state is trying to remove, it, uh, remove from it. Okay, so let's get right down to um, the, uh, this big central story. By the way, on Thursday, I'm very excited. I was just writing my lecture for Thursday this morning. I found a fantastic clip um, of uh, Hugh Laurie, who you'll know from House, and Rowan Atkinson, who you'll know from Mr. Bean, enacting an early 19th century election. And I just can't wait to show. In fact, I'm half-minded just to scrap this lecture and move straight to that. <laughs> um, but you're not going to get that lucky. Um, okay, so let us go back a little period into the 18th century. Okay? Critically, the state in the 18th century becomes associated with a critique of old corruption. That is to say that the state is seen to be interested. It's, it seems to be have officials that are advancing their own interests. Um, and there are a variety of reasons why reformers in the 19th century thought this was the case. On the first point, you were appointed to government office primarily by forms of patronage. You would have you know, a, uh, a, 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 a family friend, yeah, and, and usually we're talking about you know, aristocratic and gentry circles who would find you in office, a, a post in this or that um, office. Salaries were also widely divergent. Okay? They were sort of, there were salaries attached to these posts that were stuck at specific historical levels and had been there um, for a, an awfully long time. And finally, reformers suggested that the reason why the 18th century state appeared so corrupt was because officials were ostensibly appointed for a duration of the king's pleasure. That is to say that you could be sacked at any moment. Okay? You could be removed from office. So these created the conditions, 19th century reformers believed, in which people were naturally going to try and feather their own nest and make what, what fortune they could from that office while they could. And in a way, the classic example of this, it would be great for me if you could put your cell phone away or your cards or whatever it is that you're fiddling with instead of distracting me. Um, the great example of this is um, the, uh, 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 the impeachment of Warren Hastings, the first... Um, Governor General of India um, in 1787. Huge showpiece trial in London. Um, uh, Edmund Burke, the conservative um, uh, uh, theorist, is one of the leading um, uh, 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 prosecutors of, of, of Hastings. And Hastings, the corruption of Hastings, was seen to denote precisely the type of old corruption and the sort of moral dissolute nature that, that government was breeding in these unreformed um, uh, conditions. Okay, so that was the old, if you like, the nature of the old state in the 18th century ancient regime, supposedly. Um, I want to give you an account now of, the new, uh, of an example through the case of taxation of how a different type of, of, of um, state emerged, which a state which